to a private girls' school that was uh, non-denominational, but it was preparatory for college. And my seventh grade English teacher, so I was 10, I think, um, gave us an assignment to research a career. I came from a medical family. My father was a physician. My mother was a nurse. And so there were journals all over our house and talk of medicine over the dinner table. And um, I always had a love of animals, probably from watching too many episodes of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Animal Kingdom, quite frankly, um, and Jane Goodall out in the jungles. But uh, in combination, researching something with medicine and animals and then presented my seventh grade English paper saying, I'm going to grow up and be a veterinarian. And that's what happened. What were dinner conversations like when you were growing up? Graphic, probably for the average person, probably talking about cases and diagnostic methods and potential outcomes. Did you understand what your parents did for a living? And oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. The school I went to um, was located in Beverly Hills, and at the do there were a lot of doctors and doctors' daughters, uh, mostly they were movie industry daughters, and so there was this movie industry daughters class of people, and then probably us at the lower level <laughs> were the doctors' daughters. And so we knew growing up from way early ages, you know, what our parents did, and, and I'm sure they probably had similar experiences that I did. But because both of them were in medicine, I think it fostered those kinds of conversations. And my sister went into, uh, she became a dietitian, so she went into medicine as well, worked at the Mayo Clinic her mm -hmm. entire career. So I had to believe it impacted both of us. Mm -hmm. Were you particularly uh, inclined mathematically, or did you love your science classes? Or? Oh, I loved science, and even in grade school, um, we didn't do camps growing up, my sister and I, but there were always summer school programs in elementary school, and I can remember having a big boa constrictor around my neck when I was in, like, I think the summer between fifth and sixth grade. And um, yeah, my parents sent me off to some whiz kid math thing during a summer. And so they knew I loved animals. I think they, they were hoping and praying until the very end that I'd go into human medicine. The thought of having one's arm up a cow's rear end probably didn't quite fit their their concept of what a debutante should be doing. So uh, you know, you, you present as a debutante, and then you, in the next breath, you're off to college and doing things, but rather unspeakable to their mm -hmm. sense of perspective. I think so. Oh, my goodness, did um, did you have other particular interests when you were growing up, other than? Science, history. I loved history. biographies of the presidents that you know, whatever little kids read at those days. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, hopscotch. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know. I think really it was. I yeah. It was. It was a pretty. I think it was a pretty rigorous rearing. My my father was of a generation. I think he was perhaps ahead of his time. He felt his two daughters had to be able to support themselves even if something went wrong in their marriage and they needed to exit. And he was planning way early on that we were going to be educated and have a career and we were going to be able to fend for ourselves in the world. So I think, you know, he, he fostered that kind of environment so that we felt we could do things, but that also meant that it was probably an environment that was more studious. So we really weren't in, all that encouraged to go into team sports and it was more what can you do for studies and as I say, this all-girls school is very much college preparatory. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can recall from your childhood or early adult years that particularly struck you that you think influences the way you spend your time now? I think I think the um, Jane Goodall in her heyday when I was growing up was, and probably Berute Galdikas and the whole Louis B. Leakey crowd. Um, were fascinating people to me. And so I did pursue primate medicine, but I thought I was going to do zoo animal medicine initially. Mm -hmm. And uh, determined after doing some externships that it was at least the, the experiences I had, it was a little more challenging for a woman in those days to mm -hmm. penetrate that particular field. So. Mm -hmm. um, other places where primates are used, of course, is laboratory animal medicine. Mm -hmm. So I actually probably followed the species rather than saying, oh, I'm going to become a lab animal veterinarian.
follow the species. So you started at Cal Poly with animal science, mm -hmm. and then you moved to Washington State University for a master's in experimental psychology. Mm -hmm. What is experimental psychology? A lot of it's animal behavior. So what, at the time, Washington State University had a very small primate center. So it's on the other side of the state of the University of Washington, which has the big regional primate center associated with it. Um, but Washington State University had a cadre of about three or four faculty members who studied primates. And so I was able, but they were all based in the psychology department. And I was busy trying to establish residency because I wanted a PhD and I wanted a veterinary degree. And WSU was one of the few programs at the time in the country that allowed you to do both simultaneously in different departments on campus. Mm -hmm. So full-time veterinary student, full-time PhD student, but none of the coursework overlapped or anything, so they were all separate. And it was, it was not common across the country for veterinary schools to support that. Or people who would be willing to split their lives like that. <laughs> I'm, I don't know that I necessarily recommend it. I would understand if somebody chose to do it. More often, the only other person in my class, well, actually the whole veterinary school that was doing it, was getting his PhD in a veterinary science. So all his coursework counted towards that. And he could do his research in the vet school. But I, I kind of wanted to understand veterinary medicine, how that would influence an animal's behavior. So I never had aspirations of hanging up my own shingle and going into private practice. I wanted more to know what's the impact of medicine or an animal not feeling well or having a particular condition on their behavior. So, and that's experimental psychology. Well, experimental psychology is a lot of it's learning and memory. It's so it's a lot of behavior. It's the it's the the rat in the maze. It's the pigeon pecking on keys. It's that kind. It's not clinical psychology. It's definitely experimental psychology. So you're usually working with an animal model to evaluate some human system, whether it's, again, learning or memory or something like that. So the term, I, I just don't know. I don't know what this means. That's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Experimental psychology refers to psychology of organisms that are involved in an experimental situation? Typically, yes. Okay. So the the people that were working with monkeys that were in the psychology department, the experimental psychology piece of it, they focused on uh, vision and some hearing, but mostly vision, and did a lot. They actually had a very unique colony that um, was, at the time that I left, they were the oldest captive rhesus monkeys in a research laboratory. Hmm. And um, they were starting to go downhill in health. And so they finally euthanized them and then distributed tissues. They brought in a whole huge collection of scientists from literally all around the world and then published a book on the aging of the macaque and what the aged macaque looks like. So, so you know, again, modeling, you know, uh, one of them was used for an Alzheimer's study. And it was just, it was just a really amazing resource. But before all that, they, they certainly use them for a variety of mostly visual acuity studies. How is the brain processing visual information? Um, that was their focus. But experimental psychology ranges quite broadly. And it's not just primates. It's, it's no, like I said, it's pigeons, it's chickens, everything. it's yeah, rats in a maze. It's the Skinner box model, that whole thing. So you did that uh, experimental psychology and the veterinary school at the same no, time? No, my PhD was in uh, wildlife biology wildlife. slash animal behavior. So I did animal, there wasn't an animal behavior department at WSU. So you sort of had to hopscotch around to, mm -hmm. to accomplish that. So, so I, I, when I was in the wildlife biology department, I was then also at the vet school. Mm -hmm. And um, you, your first work in research was in the course of your studies, or how did you first Yeah, so, that? yeah, I, that was, thank goodness that there were some PhD students in the experimental psychology department who were good friends, because, you know, your, your major professor says, okay, now you get to design a study. Come up with a question and design a study. And, and so he really wanted to shape and mold someone's brain as to how do you ask a, a a credible question, and then how do you develop a null hypothesis about what the answer might be, and then how do you proceed to test that null hypothesis? And he was a fabulous instructor, and I again, there were some PhD students who were great mentors and um, took a, a this young master's student and 
sort of help shape how you make queries of the world and, and evaluate them. So yes, it was in during my master's degree. And then when I moved over to um, my PhD program, I discovered in myself an interest in captive animal behavior and so and how environments shape animal behavior. And so if you have an aged animal that has health problems, say with aging, or you have a zoo animal who is otherwise healthy but may be a diabetic. And so how do you work with that to keep the animal healthy but also recognizing what behavioral problems can arise or maybe even using behavior to help the animal become treated. So, you know, stick an arm out for your insulin injections, for example, or something like that. Do you remember what you thought or what what you thought research was like before you were exposed to research? Or do you recall being surprised by anything once you actually got involved in no, it? No, I really don't recall. I don't really think I formulated an opinion about research, especially the use of animals in research mm -hmm. before then. Coming up in a scientific medical family, I just I just don't think it was ever on the radar screen for my... As being unusual or provocative no, in any way? No, right? And I don't think it really had the attention of the public like it does now. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I don't, I don't think I had any... I don't think I saw anything wrong, though. I mean, I, I think if, if I had, it would have jolted me enough that I might have exited the profession because, you know, you're young and impressionable in those mm -hmm. years. So, um, but I, I went in a lot of labs and as an animal science major in my undergraduate, you know, food, food animal production was a big part of it. So, um, again, just didn't see that there was a lot going on that was wrong. Now, of course, it was a university setting, so I wasn't out at the basic farms, but uh, it was pre cooks and there wasn't, you know, it was just, it was a different world, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Well, comment then on how you think the world has changed since then. Whew, tremendously. Um, a lot more oversight, which I think is a good thing. Um, I think the questions are much more sophisticated and nuanced than they were previously. What questions? The scientific questions. Okay. But you're probably wondering if I meant the public questions, and they probably are too. Um, society's questions about should animals be used? What animals should be used? How should they be used? What level of discomfort is it okay for them to feel? I think those are questions that were never thought about maybe 30 years ago. The world is a smaller place. I think that's certainly part of it. I think we are influenced by other cultures. You know, it's it strikes me, it has always struck me as odd that someone will trap a mouse in their basement and not think twice about it, and then have some concern about a mouse being used in research. That we're, and I think it's just naivete. They don't understand that there's all these regulations or oversight procedures that apply to animals in, use, in research. They don't know that there are veterinarians there taking care of the animals. They don't know that there are committees there walking through the facilities, and including a community member. Um, looking at things and making sure things are going well. I think there's just gaps in understanding and, and so I think there's an awareness but I don't know that it's a, an informed awareness. So we're a nonprofit organization and we, like all nonprofits, have a, a, a board that, that um, develops our vision and, and mission and that particular board for us is about, gosh, maybe 67 other organizations. So our board is, un is unusual and it's not a board of people selected for specific expertise, but rather of organizations whose, whose own work or, or, or mission blends with ours. So scientific organizations, uh, patient advocacy organizations, veterinary medical organizations, all send representatives to serve on our board. And we are an accrediting body. So like Medical schools have are accredited. Dental schools are accredited. Veterinary schools are accredited. We accredit. We go out and evaluate on site places that use animals in research, testing, and teaching around the world. We're the only organization that does this on a global basis. We've been in existence since 1965, and um, we have three offices spread across the world, and about 56 members on our Council on Accreditation who are professionals who have full-time jobs someplace else and volunteer their time to help us. And they're supported by an even larger group of folks who help them conduct the on-site evaluations of the animal care programs. Are uh, 
uh, facilities required to have this kind of accreditation? No, it's voluntary participation. There are good reasons for them to engage in accreditation by ALAC. It speaks to their sense of wanting to demonstrate that they meet a high level of care for their animals, but there are, there are no regulatory requirements to do so. So why would, some, why would um, what are some good reasons, well, it's a, it's a, it's a showing, it's a, it shows the public or or shareholders, shareholders or potential clients that they perform to a certain quality. Mm -hmm. Or if you're trying to recruit top drawer scientists, you want to be able to assure them that at your university you're doing things the best that can be done. Uh, those kinds of reasons. What are uh, unusual challenges or are there um, different situations that you find internationally with accreditation? Is it the same process pretty much where you go? The process or? is the same. The the environments differ. So I think one area of variability that is widely acknowledged is the quality of training and competency of veterinarians who support animal research programs in different countries around the world. So the basic veterinary degree is probably quite similar among Western-based countries, but beyond that, it, it could be quite different with, with a different emphasis. So in the United States, you typically get a four-year undergraduate, although that's not always the case, but typically get a four-year undergraduate degree and then go on and get your four-year veterinary medical degree. In other countries, it may be a three- or four-year degree post-high school. And it's often based on uh, providing clinical care to food animals. So getting those people trained to the specific anatomy, physiology, uh, disease conditions of a mouse or a rat mm -hmm. is, is a bit of a leap. So they have to be provided training in some manner. That's not ALAC's job, but we recognize that, that it's, it is a variable um, commodity around the world, the, the caliber of laboratory animal veterinary medicine. Is this a tough sell to uh, around the world? Or do people really I don't think want so. to be I think, in Yeah, this? I think it's, it's more access to the information. Most, most of it's in English, mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly. Uh, they may not have the same drugs available in their country that we have. There may be stricter permits as to how you move drugs in. There may be um, different cultural in influences, societal, religious influences. Mm -hmm economic impacts. So yes, it's it's not, I don't think, a, a lack of, sometimes I just don't think they, they know what they, they don't know what they don't know, you know that, that old saying. So uh, it could just be that. But there have been a number of efforts of training in recent years and trying to, to uh, translate documents and, and make, make information more accessible in a variety of ways. And I think that's helping. And there are a lot of international organizations beyond ALAC who share an interest in this um, this uh, activity of trying to elevate the caliber of veterinary medicine worldwide and and that helps everybody so that would be a new trend I mean you've seen I think yes it's a relatively new trend new wish would be within say the last 10 years or so mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. I mean we're all aware of websites that have very dated pictures from an era when there wasn't as much oversight and you know you can capture opinion with by targeting emotions and uh, more so than targeting intellect and so you put up some gruesome picture and it's decades old but it's not explained that that's the case and you know stop torturing animals is the logo underneath it and that's all over the World Wide Web. So, but on the other hand, where I was going to go with it is, it also can serve as a wonderful reservoir of information for scientists in other countries. If and if particularly if they can read English, then you know they can access journals, they can access even abstracts of journal mm -hmm. articles, and there are a lot of training materials that are freely available on the web through. ALAS and other of our organizations and the and other organizations in other countries. So there's it, it can it's this you know two-edged sword I think that it it uh, it can be this wondrous source of current up-to-date information and if it's used appropriately then that's very helpful 
to the science and the animals, and the public should appreciate that piece of it, I think. But there is this this tendency for it there to be a one-sided story told, and if it's plucking at, at heartstrings or the emotions, it's it doesn't matter how you try and overcome that with facts. I think that it's it's um, that's just a more challenging more challenging uh, opinion to sway because mm -hmm. I think also once someone has seen one of those photographs, that's yeah, the that's image they it. live with forever. Mm -hmm. You can't undo that. Do you, does um, ALAC have a, an online educational component to it? We have uh, a senior director, veterinarian, who does our education outreach and we do have some of our PowerPoint presentations, mm -hmm. our newsletter articles, uh, articles we've published in journals available on our website. But truthfully, our educational program is more targeted to the institutions mm -hmm. to help them achieve a good standard, mm -hmm. help them win. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a section of our website that is for like student information, IACUC information, but more often than not, we're pointing to the real experts in those fields because mm -hmm. education while it's certainly a, a component of what we do, public education is not our primary mission. And there are so many other organizations in our field that are just you know have fabulous resources and tools available for that. And it's better to, for us to point to them. And some of them are on our board of trustees, so they can you know there's that that synergy that builds from that. Are there unusual uh, pairings, partnerships, or friendships on your board? I mean, you mentioned a few. These, a patient advocacy group mm -hmm. and a veterinary something, I forget exactly who you meant. Those aren't what I would consider obvious neighbors on a, on a board. In fact, one of our original 14 board members was Cystic Fibrosis. Fibrosis Foundation. So, so it, why? How because does that come you about? know, it's 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 funny that that in the early days, I think it, they they got the connection between animal models helping patients. And so, for example, now a wonderful organization, Americans for Medical Progress, which is a patient advocacy organization, is on our board, sitting you're right next to um, American College of Lab Animal Medicine, for example. So, but they understand the the connection between if they're going to be new surgery techniques developed, new gene therapies developed, new drugs developed, they're not going to be testing those in the human population. They're going to be testing those in animals first. Uh, is, has this been a, a natural and normal progression of collaboration? Has, have you had to work to... It's been natural. In fact, the American Medical Association was also one of our founding board members. Why uh, Why am I surprised by this? I'm, I'm not sure. There's been an initiative, you know, it's, everybody says this is new initiative, but it's really not new. It's probably now about eight years old, uh, called One Health. So it's the health, human medicine, veterinary medicine, the health of the environment, all of how they play together. So you have... a you know, a, a beef cattle lot near a stream and, you know, our chemicals running down into the stream and yet there's a veterinarian there taking care of the animals and the animals then go into the food chain and it's all of the interrelatedness of those things. The One Health initiative has, I think, been a very, it's been a way to tell the public our story, but I don't think it's a new concept. You know, I guess I, I believe that the people who study animals to solve some incurable disease or to advance our knowledge in other ways, they're my heroes. And um, they're working in partnership with the eye cooks who help to oversee their work, the veterinarian who helps take care of the animals, the people who are changing out the cages and giving the mice and rats new bedding and new fed food and water. You know, it's just this big team working together to try and improve the lives of people and animals because let's not forget that the work that's being done on animals also improves veterinary medicine for companion animals, new surgical techniques, new drugs and so, and so forth. So you know they're all and the animals themselves are my heroes too. Every every mouse, every rat. I mean it's just it's it is a controversial field and and as I said to you earlier I had a great boss who said when you go in an animal room and you don't think we can do it better time to leave the business and I've I think that way. We got to just keep being nimble about how we view what we do, how we house our animals, 
we want to support research, we don't want to put scientists out of business because we'll all pay the price for that, but by the same token we need to make sure we're, being, we're doing it in the most humane manner possible. So there is, there is that, that edge maybe, not so much a controversy, but it, there's got to be some sense of, of an edge or maybe some dynamic in each person that feels some level of conflict that they know the big picture they're doing noble work, very noble work, but on the day-to-day -day level, it's tough. And when it stops being tough, again, I think that's probably the time to leave. Um, so there is that. And, and I've been in challenging situations. I've been trapped on airplanes and someone says, what do you do for a living? And they don't approve of what I do for a living. Or How do you describe what you do to a, a layperson? I tell them I work for an organization that goes around the world trying to improve the welfare of animals used in research, that we support the use of animals in research, we want it to be done properly so that the animals are taken care of and we get the best science possible out of it. But even that can, can raise someone's ire and I won't ever forget a flight attendant who made my life absolutely miserable for about a five hour flight um, because she didn't agree with... So with, how did she do that? Oh, kicking my seat and dropping a beverage in my lap and, oh yeah, yeah. But you know, it's, it's, she's entitled to her opinion and you just got to stay calm. Have there been other instances where you've had to defend yourself? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How about your family? My husband um, used to work at the National Institute of Health, Institutes of Health and um, one of the investigators that, who had animals that, my husband helped take care of, was targeted. And so vicariously, my husband was targeted. And we happened to live in the same small town as the investigator. And so there um, were some instances that were not entirely pleasant. But, you know, it's just you either believe in what you do and stand by your principles, or you let people walk all over you. And if you have principles and you think, you're trying to do the best you can to help the animals and help the science and help then the public and our animals. You know, it's, you live by that. So in your heart of hearts then, uh, it, clearly you, you're well-intentioned and you believe in what you're doing and you've said these animal researchers, they're your heroes. So what's the problem? How, what's the problem and what can we do? Well, I've seen more than what other people have seen. The average person isn't going to be going into animal facilities and seeing the, the toys that are given to the mice to play with in their cages and the fact that they have a veterinarian on call 24-7 and they're getting better food probably than somebody who's going off to McDonald's to eat and they're getting pure water and 12-hour light cycle and I mean just the care, the, the basic care, the fact they're given environmental enrichment toys or whatever to, to make their lives better. And when you meet the staff at the cage level who spend all the time with those animals, I mean, they, those, those people are dedicated. They, they care about those animals. And the public's never, I don't think, ever going to see that degree of caring like I have had the privilege of seeing in my career. So I don't know how we, and I think Neighbor and, and FBR, FBR, Foundation for Biomedical Research, they do a really good job of trying to inform the public about this very message. But, you know, we're on a limited budget on our side and the, I'm afraid that the, uh, the, the folks that aren't quite so supportive of, of animal-based research have, tend to have bigger budgets than, than we do. So it sounds like you're identifying the problem as um, uh, just a lack of the, the, the public um, segments of the public are not informed, they're not aware, they haven't experienced. Or they're informed the to some degree mm -hmm. or with some pieces of information. But not fully informed. Not fully informed. I prefer that, yeah. Right. They're not fully informed and, thank you, and not fully informed and haven't experienced some of the more positive right. daily realities right. of animal use and research. And then you've also alluded to the fact maybe there's not an easy answer. I mean, how could you possibly do that? I mean, look how many brains over how many years have been trying to figure out how do we get our message out to the public. And, and you know, we don't want to get to the point where we're not being able to, we're not able to develop new medicines or new surgical techniques or new cures for diseases to finally say, see, 
we were right. <laughs> we need animal-based research. We don't want to get to that extreme point. Mm -hmm. I think it's we absolutely need to keep looking at alternatives. We absolutely need to keep looking for re refinements in the way we do things and replace the use of animals whenever we can and certainly the, reduce the number of animals we use if we can and still keep things statistically valid, essentially the three R's. Mm -hmm. And I think the world is definitely moving that way. More and more regulations all around the world are, are embedding the concepts of the three R's in our research. Can so you please describe what the three R's are? Replacement, refinement, and reduction. So replace the use of animals or more broadly interpreted, replace a higher order animal with a lower order animal, if you will. So instead of doing something all on monkeys, we'll do it on crayfish, you know, something like that. That's a pretty extreme example, but that's the concept. Refinements, um, providing environmental enrichment, using more sophisticated techniques uh, in a certain procedure, replace reduction, reducing the number of animals to the statistically minimum necessary to prove the validity of your answer. So the three R's. And, and Russell and Birch in 1959 proposed this concept and um, it's been around a long time but it really has certainly gained traction globally. And so it, literally you're seeing it in Japanese regulations, mm -hmm. Korean regulations, Chinese regulations. It's showing up in South America. It's all over the European Directive, Canada, United mm -hmm. States. So really it's become quite a global phenomenon. And that's just probably within the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years since, and they were published in 1959. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, there's a tremendous improvement. And so I think if, but it's again a hard thing to say, look where we are now compared to where we were 30 years ago. We're so much better. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that's ever going to be good enough for some detractors. Right. And that's the problem. When I graduated, I was uh, recruited to the National Institutes of Health to head up their environmental enrichment program. And at that time, new regulations were being drafted by the USDA to address the psychological well-being of, that was the phrase that was used, psychological well-being of non-human primates and exercise for dogs. And because I already had a demonstrated research interest in captive animal behavior, it was a nice segue um, to head up that program at the NIH and it, it was I was there seven years uh, there doing that kind of research and starting from nothing essentially an environmental enrichment program for as many species of, as we could possibly manage and you know, there are no, Nobel laureates there and and a lot of people to of different persuasions and different scientific backgrounds to persuade that this really was the right way to go. And today, no one would even think twice about it. But back then, it was breaking entirely new ground. And, you know, you're, you're young and you're new to the institution and you're trying to make people do something that you think would be really good for the animals <laughs> and good for their science. And you're, you're, in a, you're in a position of needing to market that and get buy-in and, and learn from them too. I mean, I, I learned a ton from talking to them about, yeah, you know, that's a really good point. Let me, let me rethink that part of it and, you know, just work together collaboratively. But so when I left the NIH, I, I moved over to ALAC and, um, and the program was blossoming and humming along. And, and so, you know, you start with essentially nothing and you put your fingerprints all over it and then you've got something that's very solid that, again, at the time was probably the the um, lead program in the country for what we were doing. And that's because the NIH supported it. The upper administration, no single person can come in and do anything in an organization of 15,000 people unless there's key support at the top, and, and there was. And, and you know, that's, again, my hat's off to them because they were very visionary. But it allowed me to, to launch something that was quite significant within the NIH. Mm -hmm. I love working at ALAC. I, I think I have the best job in the country in lab animal medicine. I really do. I, I have been able to go to countries over more than probably 15 years and watch their lab animal profession mature and evolve and mm -hmm. be a part of that and um, work with tremendously smart people who are all committed to the same principles, you know, the best for the animals, the best for the science. And I mean, I just, I have, I don't have any real thoughts about 
gosh, that was a really terrible time in my career. I mean, just I've had a wonderful. I've just been really blessed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just I work for a great organization, and and when I was at the NIH, I was working for a great organization, and again, great support from the upper administration there. And ALAC's just been a fabulous, fabulous place to to. Um, do good things for animals and do good things for science. Well, what do you imagine is in the future, um, in the next 10 years or 20 years or even 50 if you want to go that far? Uh, and in, in any realm, I mean, there's a few, I, I shouldn't ask a multi-layered question, but I will. Like, what do you imagine is the future for ALAC? What do you imagine is in the future for the use of animals in research? What do you imagine is in the future? for um, the public, um, ongoing public participation and debate about animal use and research. Where do you think we're going? Well, ALAC is going to, I think, continue to look globally and try and help countries that are nascent in their animal research programs or don't have a regulatory framework that supports it to perhaps a global level. So I think we will continue to look around the world and say, where can we be helpful? I mean, we want you to win. We want you to succeed. We want good data coming out of your labs. You're going to use animals. Let's use them right. Let's generate good science. So I think for ALAC, we'll be looking to see how we can advance that further. Um, and I don't see that stopping. I'll take it 100 years out, since I don't know about 50. I'd like, I'd like to think there would be a day when all of our other science will be so sophisticated that, or maybe cellular, that we won't need live animals in research. So that someday we're all going to be putting ourselves out of business, which is probably a cockeyed way to look at it, but I, I don't think we're, I know we're not there. I know we're not there. And I don't think that it's in the five year, 10 year, 20 year zone. But if I look back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the number of alternatives that we've developed, um, the, the more sophisticated way we're able to, like through imaging techniques, we don't have to use as many invasive surgical procedures because we can image animals now. So I'd like to think that as we continue to move technology forward, we're going to be able to move away from using whole body systems. There will probably always be some, you know, behaviorists like myself, we want to study animals, now whether that's in the wild or the zoo or whatever, but that's non-invasive. Um, so there may be some questions out there that we'll always be curious about how animals interact with the environment or if climate change continues, how are they going to interact with changing environments. And there may be new questions generated as science evolves that, you know, certainly I can't predict. But I think all of us would like to think we'll reach a point where medicine will be so sophisticated, sort of the Star Trek model. You know, you put a little thing on, you buzz them, and they're all cured, you know, and that's it. And, then, and it doesn't take a lot of animals to reach that question or, or to figure out how to address a, an individual person's particular problem. But right now, we're looking at individualized medicine, and you probably have friends, like I have friends with breast cancer, who they take the tumor cells, they inject that, my friend's tumor, breast cancer tumor cells, in a mouse, and then they study what drugs work best to kill those tumor cells. Well, right now, individualized medicine looks like it's going to be looking at mice as a way to deal with those questions. So. I say, I, I don't know when that's off in the future, but I, I think we all would like to strive for that. Um, sometimes it seems like the average person on the street does not really understand how animal use in scientific research actually works. I think that's a fair it, assessment. So, so what do you think is the most important thing for that person on the street to understand? Um, I'd say highly regulated, but I'm not sure that even that would resonate with the person. But if you say that there's a lot of oversight from community, the public, you know, the community member on the IACUC, from veterinarians, from people who are trained specifically to care for uh, 
feed, clean the cage, water the animals, things that they probably haven't even thought to ask or inquire about or just it's it's just this sort of black hole and they don't even know what questions to ask. But I think if you just say it's a highly regulated industry. So like when we were talking earlier I said it's more highly regulated than the use of people in research. Well, that might convey a message, but what does that really mean for the animal that's that they hear is being used and there's pain or there's some lump on the mouse that's obviously a tumor and that image is really awful looking to the public and what does that mean? But if you can explain the oversight, the the level of care they're given, both at the cage level but also by the veterinarian. You've got caring scientists who they want that animal to be as as healthy as possible so that they're getting reliable data because some other lab someplace else may be judging their data based on something come out of their lab. So you know to everybody it's to everybody's benefit for that animal to be well taken care of and I, I'm just not sure that's an easy message to convey but that would be what I'd want to say to the John Q public. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have pets? Oh yes. What do you have? What pets do you have? Four dogs, four cats, and two horses. I live on a farm. Oh my goodness gracious. Four dogs. Um, does your relationship with your pets, is it deeper, different, more objective than anybody else's because of what you know through your work experiences? Are you a different kind of pet owner because of your background? I think I'm probably a different kind of pet owner because I'm a behaviorist, not because I'm a lab animal veterinarian. So they're all very well mannered. <laughs> <laughs> they will train. Even the horses come when they're called. <laughs> do you, you click train them? No. <laughs> Are they crate trees. trained? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, my husband and I talk about this. So when we have an animal that's more of a geriatric age and things are starting to go wrong and and um, you know we know we know that we can have that particular surgery done because somebody figured out how to do it way early on and perfected the technique and now you know whether it, even if it's just using a laser instead of a scalpel you know that that all that makes it quicker easier less painful for the animal all that's coming out of research. So yes, we're probably biased in that way, but I don't think it I don't think on a day to day level we're probably thinking about that. What has been your um, involvement with Primer? God love them. They keep asking me to speak every once in a while. So <laughs> how many years how many years have you been Oh good question. I think I came to Primer meetings without being a speaker a couple years after I started at ALAC. So I did not come when I was working at the NIH. So that would be 19... So 1994 is when I started. So probably roughly around 1996. Mm -hmm. um, and my former boss, John Miller, who um, was very involved with Primer and very much one to share, made sure... At the time, I was the only other veterinarian in the office. So, the, you know, so he was, he was very willing to allow others to bloom under his leadership. And so he offered me, so when Prim would ask him to do stuff, he'd offer whether I wanted to give that particular talk. And so I've probably been talking at Primer conferences maybe since 1997 or 8, somewhere in there. Do you speak at the AER conference also or just IACUC? No, just IACUC. Have you been to an AER mm -hmm. conference? Mm -hmm. Have you ever participated in an IRB meeting? Mm -mm. Um, I a cook meeting, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I'm just so interested to know the, the differences in, in, in your professor. Well, Joan Racklin is, um, talk about heroes, she's, she's one of mine. I can say that because she's not in the room and she probably won't even see this part of it, but she really is an amazing individual. Why? And Oh, a heart as big as Texas and smart and um, she's willing to bring people with different opinions together. And that's what I think has always set Primer apart. And the audiences are always polite to someone who has a vastly different opinion from them. And I've, I, when I was at NIH, I was actually sent to give a talk for one of my bosses to an unfriendly audience who made it quite 
hostile for me. So I can come to Primer and see someone on the on the podium who is not entirely supportive of animal research, and people listen politely and will ask polite questions. They may probe, they may be probing questions, but they're not rude. And I think mo most of that is attributable to Joan, creating this environment, tapping on people who share her sense of, let's find out about each other. Let's find out where we have commonalities and where we differ, and, and can we bridge any of those differences? So yeah, she's, she's, she is a hero, and she is unique, and uh, has been really a blessing, I'm sure, to the IRB community, but I don't know that at first hand, mm -hmm. but she sure has been a blessing to my community. So at these iCook conferences, then what would you say is the, the greatest benefit, or more than one great benefit that you find when you attend these conferences? There's something for everybody. So if you're a community member on an iCook, there are presentations tailored to your needs. If you are um, an iCook chair, there are presentations tailored to your needs. But then they also try really hard to, to get speakers who can speak to more current issues or um, what's going on in the government that may be problematic or maybe having a ripple effect uh, in our community. Um, so there's always this, you know, sort of new information that's being disseminated to iCook members and the veterinarians who attend as well. So the fact that it's the information is kept fresh, and that they try and really tailor it to a wide variety of people within our community, so mm -hmm. that everybody's needs are met, and that's that's a huge challenge. And they seem to succeed year after year after year. It's amazing to me. I think the face to face is really important, and I I think they they get that. Um, the dialogue that occurs in the breakout groups, especially, you know, these smaller, and they have so many running simultaneously, but that then carves up their large audience into manageable sizes so that you really can have people who share really strong interest in a particular topic sharing their experiences at their institution or learning from the presenters. Even that dialogue, I see people taking notes when someone else in the audience is sharing how they do something. I think that face to face is highly valuable. But I also, having just participated in this, um, Lab Animal Science Bioconference Live, which the whole thing was a webinar, and I think my keynote had like, I think they told me like 700 people, 800 people attend all, from all around the world. You know, that's an outreach that has a lot of merit to it. So the fact that this year Primer's opening this up by a webinar, I think, is a really neat first step. Mm -hmm. I'd hate to see them lose the face-to-face -face piece of it because I just think there's a lot of synergy that comes out of people talking to each other. But by opening it up electronically, you certainly can diversify your audience. Have you noticed any trends in your field in the past, I don't know, I'm going to say 20 years or 10 years or 5 years or any particular changes that you would consider important to the quality or the success. I mean, in terms of educating? or It could be in, in anything, in, in how people are educated or in how um, animal welfare is treated or progressing. Or I think there have been a, a lot of seminal changes. So I, I do believe that the concept of, of webinars has just taken off and as a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, podcasts, these little brief, here's a bullet message and here's some information about it. I think also very informative. Uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association just formed or approved the formation last year of the American College of Animal Welfare. So now there's a whole board specialty, board certification specialty, just in animal welfare. It's not just research animal welfare, it's bovine, sheep, companion animal, shelters, it's, you know, you name it, lab animal. Uh, and that's huge. I mean, the AVMA does not add board specialties willy-nilly or every year or anything else. And so um, mm -hmm. it, I think that really, and of course the AVMA has set as one of its strategic objectives animal welfare, as has the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE. They did a strategic plan in 2005, and animal welfare was one of their top five strategic objectives. Mm -hmm. So. I, I think that we are seeing more and more attention to it from the veterinary side, the scientist side. So yeah, lots of seminal changes. 
the delivery of information is changing, more translations of documents, so the information is more accessible, more things posted online. It's, it's an evolving world. But the other side of that, of course, is it's, it's easier to send a mole into a facility. Something goes wrong or something is made to go wrong, and then that's on YouTube for the universe to see. If you could influence a major change in how um, eye cooks function or how animals are used in research with, without regard to the need for resources, I mean, if you were the boss, you'd have anything you wanted with either eye cook functioning or animals in research. How would you finish this sentence, if only? Oh, wow. <laughs> Hmm. This is my final question, by the way, so you can take a minute and think. I was going to say, that one wasn't on the piece of paper. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Surprise question. I think IACUC members are extraordinarily dedicated people who get very little reward for the service they render to their colleagues and the institutions they serve. And if only they could be recognized for the hard work they do in trying to preserve the institution and being able to do high quality research for their institution. I, I would like that to be part of my, I think that would be part of my answer. If only they could be supported to the degree they needed to be, that they could be recognized by the, their colleagues and the institution for this amazing service that they render um, that would certainly be part of it. If only we could thank the animals. If only we could thank the animals. Mm -hmm. If only we could somehow thank them. Like so many Asian cultures have a monument uh, on the grounds of the institution and they have a ceremony once a year and they'll bring flowers and they'll say typically Buddhist prayers uh, to the monument thanking those deceased animals for the service they rendered over the course of the year. And we have no custom like that here in the United States where we say thank you to the animals that have done that. Mm -hmm. If we could say, if only we could, if only we could tell the people who are having to deal with that conflict that we talked about earlier, that internal conflict of gotta use the animals, but boy we really need the answer. And that, you know, wish we didn't have to, but we really need the answer. If only we could tell them how much we appreciate what they do. I think those would, so for me it's not so much a monetary thing but more of a how do we get them to understand how, because they are battered by all the other messages, how do we tell them enough how much we appreciate what they do. I guess that would be what I was, how I'd finish that sentence. That's lovely. Yeah. It's, it's true. <laughs> lovely. Well, Al, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you.